Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Full Tank Motorcycle Podcast with me, Rob, from the YouTube channel Motobomb. And as always, I'm joined by Tim. How's it going, mate? Good. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, Partway through the week, so yeah, we'll see how it goes. How are you going? Pretty good. Been out riding plenty. Good weather. Got a Tenere 7 Explore behind me, so I've been Mm. enjoying that a little bit. Nice. And I've got the 990 Duke showing up today as well, which is going to be very exciting. One that I've been really looking forward to reviewing. Mm. So life could be worse. Definitely. Have you ridden that before? Is that a new newbie to you? The 990 Duke. Yeah. Uh, it's new for this year. We had the 890 Duke R, which I thought was one of the best road bikes in terms of sportiness that I've ever ridden. And I wouldn't say it's a looker in my eyes, <laughs> but uh, for the ride, it's up there with the best. So the 990 should be technically slightly better. So definitely looking mm. forward to it. Anyway, this week on the pod, we're going to talk through some of the top news stories from the world of motorcycling. But also, excitingly, Tim, this week, mm. we've got a great giveaway for some of our listeners in the UK and also our regular slots of Comment of the Week and Bike of the Week. And it is. I always say this, but this one is tasty. <laughs> Has this exceeded expectations? Is this even better than everything you've shown me so far? Could well be, mate. We'll leave that up to you though when we get to it. (laughs) Anyway, first up, a new announcement from Ducati, which is going to be, I think, well received. And that is that they say that on Friday the 24th of May, before the Bike Shed show opens to the general public, selective media, that's us, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we'll have exclusive access to the global reveal of two never-seen-before Scrambler prototypes. We won't be going on the Friday, but we'll cover this on the Saturday of the show. And it's a unique blend of authenticity, lifestyle, and modern design that characterizes the Scrambler. And it's about to get even more character. I don't know what that could mean. Anyway, we'll get onto mm. that in a sec. The Ducati stand at the show will also be the stage for a live, custom painting of a Scrambler icon by Tom Fuller, one of the artistic forces behind the renowned custom paint and design house, Image Design Custom. So look, mate, let's have a little brief history of the Scrambler. It was launched mm. in 2015, wasn't it, with this sort of air-cooled engine. I think it's derived from an air-cooled monster engine. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it is. It's basically a monster, and if you've ridden them kind of back-to-back, um, there's a lot of carryover between them. It feels a little bit more refined, maybe a little less powerful. I don't know whether that's just me, but maybe a little bit less strong low down compared to mine at least. Yeah. Got you. And it's got this retro styling package, which is influenced by the Ducati scramblers of like the 70s and 60s or 70s. I think 70s, but that yellow paint job with the tank mm. side panels. Uh, yeah, it's all the reference back to their history. What year was yours? You have the scrambler icon and that is from the first gen, isn't it? Yeah, I had the 2015. So I had the... Oh, was it? The, yeah, the first year, I wow. guess. Wow. Is that like the first edition of a book? Like it's more valuable because it's the first... <laughs> or is it well, less it wasn't valuable? It was a nice chip in the tank, yeah, that uh, one of my <laughs> previous colleagues did, yeah. You should have kept it in the wrapper. <laughs> After that, they spun out a few variants. So they had the Scrambler Icon, then they had the... Was it a Cafe Racer? Mm. Desert Sled, which was the more off-roady and tall suspension yeah. version. I think it was a longer swing arm as well on the um, Desert Sled. Yeah, and they reinforced yeah, the frame yeah. and a few things like that. Did they have a full throttle as well? I think they did of the first gen. So yes. there was quite a few different takes on it. But then last year or the year before, they announced this second generation of the Scrambler. It was a major update with tweaks to the chassis, new bodywork, uh, different wheels and things like that, a new technology package with a TFT display, uh, but with fundamentally a very similar feeling engine, pretty much the same air called L-Twin mm. at the heart of it. And you went out on the launch of that bike, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I don't think they'd thank you for sort of saying that it's the same, although it is. Um, I remember on the launch, they were sort of like, oh, it's like 90, 95% of it is brand new. And you're like, okay, but how does it, how does it feel so similar then? But yeah, so even yes. though they t- sort of touched upon everything on the bike, yeah, a lot of it was kind of a visual, let you say, the technology on it. And the biggest thing for me was just the fact that the throttle was that much smoother which was always one of the complaints mm. from a lot of people for the previous gen or the original Scrambler because it was a bit choppy on the The previous throttle. one was a cable, right? It was, yeah. And it was also, it was a little choppy on the throttle, but there was certain things like putting, I think it was like shims that you could put in there or a washer even just fix the throttle a little bit. So it's something you could remedy, mm-hmm. but yeah, it was uh, a little raw feeling. But I think actually when we took it out, maybe uh, you appreciate that because it can be quite fun to have something feel so sort of direct and, and simple. Yes, the first gen was a fun bike to ride. But I think 
if you're commuting and stuff, that choppiness oh, yeah. does get quite weary. Oh, and so probably the ride by wire on the new version was largely an improvement. I know exactly what you're talking about with the throttle spacers as well. I think it's throttlespacers.com. They make them from Ducati and they also make them for Triumph bikes as well. And mm. it takes that initial millimeter of slack out of the throttle travel. Mm. And that means that it's just, you know, it doesn't really change anything to do with the engine it's just the sense of control that you've got with yeah. the throttle and i did those on my street twin and i do think they made a positive mm. difference so quite a good little mod if that sort of thing bugs you and i think they're only like 30 yeah, quid or something cheap, yeah. which in the grand scheme of things if it's something a bike that you ride every single mm. day uh, is generally not mm. too bad although you know it is a mild improvement to the kind of the feel yeah. of it um, but like I said, I wouldn't expect it to fully eliminate that problem. Mm. Another good idea as well is a booster plug on the on the street twin as well, which was a little bit choppy on the throttle. I don't know if they make them for the scrambler, but basically it kind of boosts the amount of fuel when it's ticking over and stuff oh. like that in the lower revs, I think. That meant the difference between on and off the throttle was yeah, less, yeah, less, I think. Less and so that eliminated a little bit of chop. Mm, that might be a bad explanation. But basically, what happened then when they updated to this second generation with the largely improved throttle that you wouldn't need throttle spacers for or a booster mm. plug is that they slimmed the range back down, yes. didn't they? Just to the Icon, which is this yellow, most kind of retro looking version or the one that looks most similar to the original Scramblers. A night shift, which is spoke wheels and flat bars and a tuck and roll mm. seat and a really nice deep blue paint job so that's kind of more custom style and then they had the full throttle which is um more flat track inspired and we had a really good day at ducati taking all three out and trying to decide which one we like the most all of them quite fun on the road but i think in the comments of videos about the scrambler ever since it's been announced there's been a lot of i don't know disappointment perhaps that they took a few of those other bikes out the lineup, specifically the Desert yeah. Sled, which had a great reputation for being such a brilliant off-roader. It's kind yeah. of, um, it's a retro scrambler that can actually do a bit of the business off-road. Mm. Yeah, I think that one was, that is a loss. That is something that feels missing from the range because everything else really is just sort of uh, custom tweaks that maybe you could do yourself as well, really. If you want to go on a sort of high-end mm. custom, a lot of this thing is, you know, just change the wheels, change the colour change some sort of accessories indicators and things like that but when it comes to actually how the bike rides and performs the desert sled rode significantly different to the uh, icon so yeah it's a bit of a loss it'd be nice to see it come back i think almost certainly i'd expect that to be one of the two mm. although they do say and i just referenced it a moment ago that the scrambler is about to get even more character mm. <laughs> Ah, which I didn't really think hints, uh, there's nothing really there. It says the unique blend of authenticity, lifestyle and modern design. Yeah. There's nothing really saying the Scrambler's about, you know, that sort of rugged off-road vibe and it can go anywhere. Yeah. There's nothing in the press release mm -hmm. about that. And so that is, I don't know, maybe hinting that it won't be a desert sled. Yeah. And then what else could it be? Well, what are you hoping for? If you were there, what is going to wow you on the day? It's a really good question, mate. Honestly, I actually have no idea if it's not. I mean, the fact that there are two, mm. uh, I can't even think of more than the Desert Sled. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. It's almost like a cult bike. People who own them seem to love yeah. them. Like you say, it's not really a bike that you can DIY very easily to get something similar out of the no. new one from the accessories catalog. But beyond that, I don't really have any other ideas, mm. so I'm really interested to see what it is. But I did put it out to our YouTube audience on the main Motobob mm. channel. I put a community post and asked people what they wanted to see. So I thought I'd rattle through a few of them to get some inspiration. So, oh, here we go. Adith Yam Segar, 8753, suggested definitely a new desert sled. I hope they bring back the old pearlescent white and black paint job with the red accents. And I really hope they bring an 1100cc version of the desert sled for those who felt the existing 800 was a bit lacking. I guess even more character does suggest that it could be actually a different engine or something like that. I hadn't even considered yeah, that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I'd, for some reason, I hadn't even crossed my mind. Yeah, I mean, the 1100, for me, makes sense the way they kind of oriented that, to have the 1100 be a road bike and not do an off-road version. Because if you really were going to go and take your Ducati Scrambler off-road, then 800 is absolutely fine to get 
out of it what you need, right? I mean, even uh, Royal Enfield Himal Lane can break traction off road. So anything above that is well, not anything above a Royal Enfield. Maybe you could get away with a little bit more power. But um, when it comes to like eight hundred, it's more than enough to have a great time off road, mm. and it also keeps it relatively well lighter than an eleven hundred would be. So I don't think I'd be uh, screaming out for an eleven hundred off-road version i understand why that would be exciting but i think keeping 800 is fine but you're right it could be that they're actually just bringing out a bigger version of it which also they're sort of lacking from the lineup at the moment i really loved the 1100 Mm. and i think it's i don't know if it's underrated but a lot of people say they prefer the 800 because it is smaller and lighter and even as a road bike a lot of people prefer that and yeah, I do get it. But when I rode the Tribute Pro yeah. 1100, the really nice yellow one with the retro Ducati logo yes. on the tank, it's like a 70s logo. Oh, I just really enjoyed it, mate. Honestly, I thought For it sure. was like a bit of a, it felt more muscular, yeah. a bit more squat. Yeah. The sound was fantastic. There was True. all that torque on tap. And so I don't know if it's just my particular taste. Well, so that's what I, I, I agree with. Of, uh, I, I borrowed that one day. for a long, long term as well, actually. So I got that for like sort of two weeks from them yeah. as well. So I agree. Um, and my, my angle or my question was really, does it give you more? Does it, does it worth going for the 1100? Uh, so maybe I sort of communicated uh, incorrectly. But I think that the 1100 on the road makes sense to me. And it was a nicer bike. And I preferred the 1100. Uh, it wasn't a huge amount more power, but enough to make a difference. But if I was going off-road, like I say, mm. if you really were going to go and take your desert sled off-road, then I think 800 is fine. I wouldn't be screaming out for more power because ultimately I probably couldn't use all of what the 800 has off-road. Um, it's just that if you were going mm. to use that one as a taller bike and you just wanted it to look like it could go off-road, but realistically you're just going to use it on tarmac, then yeah, fair enough. An 1100 would make sense. There's a couple of other suggestions for different engine configurations here. So D Viper 11 says 698 mono powered scrambler, or better yet, throw in a monster 698 too. Now, the 698 mono is their new single cylinder liquid cooled mm. engine that powers that new hyper motard. Haven't tested it out yet, but it's coming in June or July, I mm. believe. So looking forward to taking it for a spin. I wouldn't necessarily say that's even more character. Mm. <laughs> um, as per the press release or maybe for some people it depends if you like a single yeah. or not but i think that the, the l twin air cooled is like the most um probably nostalgic or emotive mm. ducati mm-hmm. engine configuration for most people and I'd say that is peak character mm. but certainly a 698 mono would be a very lively thing because it's nice and light yeah. and it still makes around the 70 horsepower mark maybe a bit more actually so it could make for a slightly more punchy scrambler Mm. but i think that's a long shot i also think maybe we're missing the um sort of double meaning of the word character when people talk about bikes which is sometimes it Mm. means it just feels really nice and sometimes it means it's worse but uh i can't find a better word for it so yeah maybe and i'm not saying the single cylinder is worse but generally speaking if it was a choice between one cylinder or two cylinder i'd be going for the two cylinder having lived with singles for a while they're great but they there is a sort of ceiling there's a limit to it at which point you sort of go yeah i'm kind of over this now and i'd prefer it to be a little smoother uh, maybe rev out a little bit more but no I, i'm very curious to try that one because obviously that's a new single and it's it's not quite as um raw or uh, unrefined as singles of old i've been riding quite a lot of single cylinder bikes recently like the triumphs and the hasvana mm-hmm. Svart 401 the himalayan 450 mm. and i gotta say i'm really looking forward to a few <laughs> <laughs> twin cylinder bikes yeah I've got the 1390 Duke, Super Duke coming as well. Big yeah. V-Twin. Not that they're bad and they no. do a job and they're certainly suited to a certain price point as mm. well. It's obviously, you know, nice talky little engines. But yeah, I wouldn't say it's necessarily my favourite and a bike that I permanently want to be no. riding. Especially with the Himalayan, which we talked about a little bit. It's um, slightly buzzy at motorway speeds and stuff. Mm. And yeah, a nice twin sounds good. So hopefully they keep the scrambler that way. User J... I-5-Z-G-A-N-I-5-0 <laughs> says, I know it's not the first Ducati scrambler that comes to mind, but I'd really like to see another A2 compatible 400cc scrambler like the 62, which is a good point, actually. That's yeah. one that disappeared from the lineup mm. that kind of went unnoticed. And certainly, you know, if you're A2, a bike like that is probably going to look quite appealing. Mm. I think it was slightly lower on price as well. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, yeah, they've dropped it from the lineup. So maybe that'll come back? Possibly. I mean, yeah, to be fair, in terms of the market at the moment, that sort of uh, that bracket is uh, having a bit of a resurgence because, yeah, like you said, you mentioned the Triumphs, right? So you've got some smaller mm. capacity Triumphs out there. You've got, obviously, still the Svart Pillen from Husqvarna, um, KTM. You've got Royal Enfield. So, yeah, actually, as far as a bracket goes, I think that's probably more dictated by market, right? If they just see that people are buying it, then they'll be like, I want a piece of that action. And they did have one. So that would kind of make sense. I mean, I wouldn't that wouldn't necessarily wow me. <laughs> But it would be no. uh, maybe a sensible choice for him. So, yeah, it'd be cool to see. Yeah, I hadn't really considered that. It's a good point. There's so, ma- so many manufacturers sort of pushing into that space yeah. that maybe it is actually more lucrative than it appears from the outside. Mm. Gojo Satoru Sama said, Ducati Cafe Racer is the need. And what I've been saying, well, I've got two thoughts on this. Mm. Number one, I'd be quite surprised because cafe racers generally have been discontinued, like the BMW R90 Cafe, oh, R90 Racer, sorry. The uh, Thruxton recently got discontinued. So it doesn't seem like there's a big demand for Mm. clip-on uncomfortable bikes like that. But I will say Bike Shed Show is probably the most clip-ons per square mile (laughs) (laughs) of the year. And also, uh, of all the bikes that fit into this, um, the Scrambler's about to get even more character Mm. versus a Desert Sled, or a 698 mono version, mm. or a 400cc A2 version, Cafe Racer is actually the one that fits the bill mm. most accurately. Mm. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I agree with your point. Uh, I think that people are moving away from it a little bit. The Ducati Scrambler Cafe Racer never really made sense to me. It's one of those names where you're like, just throw some words together, <laughs> right? It just doesn't. <laughs> it's what a bike is like. Oh, I hadn't like, thought of that. They're like scramblers. They like cafe racers. Yeah, it never really made sense. But then Scrambler is a, it's a brand. It's not necessarily saying this is a Scrambler, take it off road. Um, and that's not true of really almost any of the lineup because you wouldn't properly go and take them off road they're not the most uh, appropriate tool for the job so yeah no it was a good bike though I, yes. I would say though really nice looking bike to me that feels more like a monster like a sort of custom monster and i think it maybe leans more into that but yeah it's a good bike regardless the only issue i had was the name the only thing i will say about that cafe racer i mean i agree the name is like i wouldn't is it an oxymoron yes <laughs> I guess they're not quite exclusive, but it does seem like a bit of a uh, uh, contradiction, yeah, let's say, yeah, at yeah. least. Is the proportions... I mean, it's kind of a cool-looking bike, mm. um, but maybe the proportions look a little bit weird because you think of like a cafe racer being quite stretched out mm. and um, having this straight line through the seat, tank, and fairing, whereas the cafe racer, maybe with the black and the gold wheels, they did one with black and gold cast wheels. That's quite a nice-looking bike. Mm. But I think the original, or the 2020 version, sorry, so actually the second version, Mm. was spoke wheels, blue frame, silver bodywork. I don't know, it just looks maybe a bit like it's limited by the Scrambler's fundamental proportions. Like Mm. it's got a very flat headlight Mm. and almost like a, I was going to say snub nose to it. (laughs) And yet they've elongated the seat a bit visually with the sort of um, seat cowl. And yeah, it doesn't quite work all together for me. But yeah, I think it's quite a high possibility that that is one of the bikes we might see could be yeah i think for me that bracket has been fulfilled a little bit by the night shift so i kind of don't necessarily see the need because of the spoke wheels the slightly lower bars the riding position was similar Mm. but bearable so i think that that one is a more sort of sensible pick but we'll see well, who knows? I'm I'm looking forward to finding out. We'll be there to shoot a podcast episode of our favourite bikes from the show uh, on the Saturday. Should be there all day. So please do say hello if any of you listening are there and you see us making our way around the show. And that brings us nicely, Tim, onto our giveaway for this week. I think it's the first time we've done a giveaway on the pod, isn't it? Yeah, I was going to say. I think it is. Exciting times. Well, Hopefully the first of many, but you can win two VIP tickets to the Bike Shed Show. So that gets you in on the Friday night, which is a bit more of a party atmosphere. Mm. But also you can get in for the rest of the weekend. So I think Saturday, Sunday, so it covers you for the whole thing. Uh, But only VIP tickets can get in on that Friday night. So if someone wants to win a pair of tickets, then this is how to enter. Leave a comment below the YouTube version of this episode 
And what I want to know is what your dream ultimate custom bike would be. So the base bike and then what you do with it. Please only enter uh, if you're in the UK or able to travel to the UK on the weekend of the 24th and 26th of May. It's coming up very soon. And also if you actually want to use the tickets and go. I don't mind if you've already got tickets, standard tickets, and you want to get yourself some VIP action and give away your other tickets to your mates or whatever. But yes, please, we want people to use these and actually be able to make it to the show. In fact, some people might want to play the game with coming up with your dream custom bike, so do that. But if you want to enter the tickets, maybe start your comment with, I'm in. Okay? <laughs> Does that make sense, Tim? That makes sense to me. I'm in. And I think uh, I can assume what your perfect custom bike would be. And I think the base bike would be an SV650. Of course, mate. Yeah. Always. Oh, you know what, actually? <laughs> Is that still at your house? Sorry to cut in. Do you still own that? Is that sitting around somewhere? Yeah, it's a work in progress, mate. Okay? <laughs> It's stalled a bit. I've been busy with some other stuff. Okay. Um, but uh, not stalled. It's stalled. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. I see what you're saying. The progress sort of figuratively. is figuratively. Yes. <laughs> yes. I fired it up the other day. It took a look, um, you know, a bit of jamming my thumb on the starter <laughs> button erratically to get it going. That's my trick. Um, but yeah, it did kick into live, so it's still good to go. I just want to um, do a few visual tweaks, but I do need to get it back on the road. They're such mm. fun bikes to ride. And I've got a fresh set of Metzlers from our sponsor to go on it, which would transform it because one of the worst things about it is the tyres are fine, plenty mm. of tread, but I looked at the date on them and they're like, they're pretty much the original tyres that came on like 20 <laughs> years ago. So uh, that needs fixing up. Anyway, I digress. Yes, maybe the 1100 Scrambler we just talked about. And I've always said I'd love a T120 custom as well. Mm. One of my favourite Bonnevilles, mm -hmm. underrated, super comfy, talky. And uh, great looking as well. What about you, your base bike? I would struggle not to um, just copy someone else. So I think I'd just be, I guess you take influence from wherever you take influence from. But uh, the... Are you going to, you, what you're saying, you'd struggle not to copy my SV650? <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, basically. I just can't, like, nothing else is coming to mind right now. Uh, for me, <laughs> I tend to sort of err on, yeah, Triumph Bonnevilles is, is such a kind of... I, I have an idea of what I would do to it, whereas there's other bikes where I just wouldn't necessarily know where to start. And the other one that you see loads, obviously, is um, BMW R, you know, insert uh, numbers here, 80, 60, 100. Because uh, we've yeah. got an R100 ourselves, actually, that my brother is still, still very nearly finished, actually. Um, it is riding and stuff. He just needs to get the suspension sorted. But um, that does look real nice. Gosh, mate. So my vote would be that one, actually. And I'll send a photo so you can see that and put it on the pod. Bike of the Week is going to be extremely relevant to you okay. today and maybe good inspiration for your brother's build. Anyway, let's get back to the point here. If you don't want to enter for the tickets or you just feel like you might not win, uh, <laughs> then there is also a discount code, MOTOBOB10, all in caps, no spaces. That'll get you 10% off tickets for the show. Uh, so you can either hold out to see if you win. We're going to draw these quite quickly because this episode is going up like, you know, pretty much just a week before the show. So we'll give you a couple of days to enter. We'll draw it on the Sunday. But if you don't win tickets, you can use that code MOTOBOB10 to pick up some last minute tickets with 10% off. So a massive thanks to Bike Shed for getting us the tickets to give away. Very nice. And also giving us that code. And um, it's nice to give some in back. So much appreciated. Moving swiftly on, we have got the announcement, mate, of the new KTM 990 RCR. There's a full video of this on the main Motobob YouTube channel. But effectively, what you've got here is a more road spec version of their RC8C, let's say. You could say that um, super exclusive, expensive track bike that they've done over the past few years. I guess this is more like a, a road version of that, but there will be a track equivalent. Or you could see it as a sports bike equivalent of the 990 Duke. And it does look rather tasty. Um, but, mate, what I wanted to talk about is those winglets, which we occasionally touch upon, the, the advent of winglets. And this has to be one of my least favourite, I'm going to say, implementations of winglets. Have you seen it? Yeah, um, I did. I, I think I saw, I've seen some posts as well. 
Um, I think I saw Chad post something actually. Yeah, there, some people are at the yeah. launch to see it in the flesh, and I think they're also riding the RC eight C track version. Yeah, I couldn't really make out because obviously with, they've got that uh, graphic on it, which ordinarily is kind of the um, camouflage. Yeah, the camouflage that they do when you get spy shots and stuff of things to kind of break up the lines or whatever they do with it. Um, so yeah, nice and nice and confusing. I have to say, those are some pretty extreme winglets. They might be the biggest I've ever seen. I don't know about you. They're pretty big. I think they're a bigger, um, but it's also the way that the shape is yeah. the opposite of the nose of the bike. Like, like that mandibles. Goes, it's got actual, like, is it centipede fangs, kind of fangs on the front? Yeah. Centipede? I, when I think fangs, I go straight to uh, vampire. Okay. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to Google, I'm going to Google centipede fangs. I'm going to look like an idiot. Oh, man. yeah. That is so accurate, mate. Nailed it. There you go. I know exactly what you mean now. <laughs> it looks a bit like a croissant, actually, a centipede head. Oh, don't put me off croissants. <laughs> but actually, you, that is really good. But, I mean, how do you know so much about centipedes? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm a man of many mysteries. <laughs> <laughs> I think also, you know, floppy moustache is definitely a potential, uh, yeah. you know, parallel that we can draw. Um, but it's just not doing it for me. And the thing that's kind of crazy about them is on the track version of this bike, it does make sense. If you're going to hit those sorts of speeds that you can do on the track, that's where it starts to work. And if you ever, they didn't release any downforce figures, but they just said it will give you more stability under braking and um, cornering. But if you actually look at some of the figures that Ducati released, for example, on their Street Fighter or Panigale, it's something like 20 kilos of downforce. Mm. I think BMW made similar claims. And then you're like, oh, that sounds good. At you know, 150 miles an hour and beyond. It's like track-only speeds where, you know, if they're saying it's going to give you stability under braking and cornering, the likelihood of hitting those sort of speeds on the road is pretty slim, especially through a corner. <laughs> yeah. And if you were doing that, then uh, prepare to lose your license. So for the road version, mm. there's absolutely no logic to have them. No. None at all. Yeah, literally no. Yeah, there is literally no reason. Unless, of course, it's that bike that you ride on the road to the track and then you can do the track and then still ride home afterwards. Kind of makes sense. Does anyone do that on a on a on something this expensive? <laughs> uh, the theory stands, but yeah, I'd love to hear if someone actually does do that. Uh, especially like you say on something this expensive. People do that, you know, we know them, but um it usually is on something that's, you know, six grand or something <laughs> you don't go risk totally. something this expensive so look the only reason that they could possibly be putting them on is to give you some of that race bike image a bit of that moto gp vibe and on a road bike it has to be purely from a styling perspective which is weird for me because i think this would be a better looking bike without the floppy mustache or the centipedes croissant <laughs> and it begs the question mate is there a visually pleasing implementation of the aero winglet that can do a bit of both you know it's there as a visual uplift mm. give a bit of that racy vibe mm. without making it look worse but also it's there for a bit of aero downforce if you ever reach those ridiculous speeds so i've got one two three four five six implementations of winglets for you to click through mm. peruse mm. and give me an a b or c4 on the visuals starting with the aprilia rsv4 X30. It is a track only bike mm. and it's um, quite expensive. I think it's like a homologation special type bike, but it's got a big whopping straight winglet across the front. Yeah. It almost looks like the front wing of an F1 car. Mm. And they've also gone with the Aprilia logo in the biggest font size they could fit to take <laughs> up the whole thing. Just in case you were wondering, given that the bike is purple, orangey, fluorescent red and silver, mm. and it has the Aprilia logo right on the middle of the windscreen there and across the middle of the tank and on the belly pan. But good to get in one more time. Um, a, B or C for that one, mate. A, B or C. Um, uh, B, because the bike actually looks quite nice. I mean, it's, it, it's still, I think, would look better without, but yeah, it's okay. It's about the same size as the KTM as well. That is uh, wider than your thighs to give someone a sort of point of reference. If you were sat on the bike, it would come out wider than your legs would. So yeah. These are potentially quite useful as, like, luggage. You could strap True. something down on those. You They're could. pretty big. I, I'd agree, actually. I might even go A on this one. The size is big, but it's the non-floppiness or <laughs> non-saggy-looking-ness. The ones on the KTM look a bit like a Salvador Dali 
melty clock thing. Mm. Um, whereas this, it's, it's, you know, almost flat. And I think that looks good. Mm -hmm. Moving on, BMW's M1000RR. You said that the KTM yeah. had the biggest, but this has got to be the biggest, mate. Yeah, that, Surely. That Look at those. Be. I mean, they can be proud of that one. Yeah, I suppose if they were just going for pure size. And again, to give someone a visual reference. Size matters. <laughs> in everything um yeah to give someone a visual reference if they are purely listening this one looks like a catfish that is a massive gaping mouth on the front and uh that's <laughs> i mean that's a c can i downgrade it to a d <laughs> yeah sure 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 i mean it's massive and again i mean you don't even have to imagine what that bike would look like without uh the winglet because i guess if you go for an s thousand rr Mm. with the sort of M package yeah. for a similar paint job. But even the new S1000RR has winglets. But yeah, the previous gen, without them, mm. in my opinion, look better. I guess if you're paying 30000 for the M1000RR, there's got to be something to let everybody... If you're cruising around on the road at road speeds, so you can't really show off the performance, mm. it's good to have a big winglet to show everybody that it is the M1000RR. That's true. And it is the along biggest. with a few so. other bits. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, that's um, a harsh verdict. Street Fighter V4S from Aducati. Uh, this one, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go in with a, I'm gonna go in with a C actually, just because they look just stuck on. They don't really, in terms of them not having any kind of purpose. I'd say on a naked bike, it makes even less sense. So yeah, for me, eh, no, don't like them. C. Ooh, harsh. That's the double stacked ones. So they're smaller winglets stuck on the side, but it does have a couple, so it's almost like tiered. And what's interesting actually is you've got a similar design now on the Multistrada V4S, mm. perhaps, mm -hmm. or the Grand Tour, maybe. Um, but they're actually for diverting airflow, and you can either open them or close them. Mm. You can like twist them. Mm. So you can let more airflow through if you are too hot in traffic mm. or in low speeds, uh, or less by putting them up if it's a cold day and you want to kind of keep your legs warm. So yeah. that is actually one functional use of something like that. But on the Street Fighter V4, I would arguably say it looks a little bit better yeah. without. without. Next yeah, one yeah. I've put is the Kawasaki H2R. Iconic bike, 300 horsepower or something, isn't it, this one? The track-only version. Yeah. And the question here, Tim, is what if you just make the whole bike winglets? <laughs> I was going to say, I actually can't even tell where the winglets stop and the rest of the bike continues. This one, I mean, everyone everyone probably knows what this one looks like anyway, right? But it's super angular, super sharp. It's a bit like if, you know, um, if you see an F1 crash, there's bits of carbon scattered all over the track. <laughs> and then someone put PVA glue all over the bike's fairing and they just drove through. Yeah. And saw which bits of carbon stuck to the front. <laughs> yeah, I actually think it is quite a breathtaking bike. Maybe that's the wrong sort of term, but it makes you stop and stare. I have to say, I haven't seen these. It's got flesh. impact. It really has got an impact to it. Yeah. So I don't hate it. I mean, it's not my looking or my style of bike. I'd go for a, a B on this one, but I think that's just a, a wider comment on the overall looks of the bike. Um, but at least the winglets are congruous to the rest of the design. This is interesting. There's um, maybe a sort of, we need to plot this on, on a graph of visual pleasingness and number of winglets. And it seems like maybe there is a, because you've given quite bad scores for the ones with one winglet. Uh, the V4S as well didn't get a great okay. score. That's got four. But if you've got maybe like six or eight on the H2R, yeah. it seems like you can sort of push through the negativity. <laughs> Fireblade. This is a more integrated attempt yeah. where they just fit in with the bodywork of the bike. Yeah, I'm actually going to say this is an A, just come straight out of the gate and say that, because this one properly does look like it's part of the bike. It doesn't look like it's just stuck on and it matches the rest of the design and complements it for my money. Do you think they're as effective, though? I'd love Probably to not. hear in the comments <laughs> from any aerodynamicists. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, but you know how, like, um, let's say an, an aeroplane wing... They put those little plates on the end to eliminate like vortices on the ends. Yeah. Is that the right word? Mm. Any turbulence on the end of the wing tip mm. that doesn't have those plates is like an inefficiency. And I think you get more lift from the full length of the wing by putting those plates on the end. So does it not stand to reason that this would have more efficient winglets because they've got these covers on the ends that stops the air spilling off? Yeah, Who knows, mate? possibly. I mean, it's, it's designed by Honda. They're not stupid. So I'd imagine they've put some thought into it, yeah. 
if they look better and work better, why wouldn't everyone do them? I guess that's the question. Mm. Maybe they look too subtle. I mean, we talked about the M thousand R R being like, let's make it very winglety, so everyone knows that you got an M thousand R R. Yeah. If they're integrated too much, it's hard to get that sort of little visual uplift and bragginess. Anyway, next up and the last one, MV F three R R, a bike we both ridden. Mm. If you remember back. I do. And uh, it was a very pretty bike at the time as well. I think this one also has something, the channels on the wheel arch as well, which direct airflow to the brakes and cool them down and stuff. So this one's quite uh, advanced, quite smart. Uh, and yeah, again, similar to the Fireblade, because it looks like it sort of blends in, it matches the rest of the bike and the rest of the design. It complements it. I'm going to put this as an A for sure. Excellent. So we've solved this one. Is that right? Yeah. I was just looking as well. I seem to remember that the... Does the RS660 have something similar, like a little bit of winglet? Anyway, I googled... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Sorry, let me just send this to you, mate. Please I do. googled RS660 winglets to see if it did have something similar. And in the Google Images results, it turns out that you can buy the winglet from the rsv 4 X Trenta for the RS660. You can just glue it on the front. Fantastic. <laughs> Bike of the week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, but the lettering's not Nearly. quite as nice, though, and it doesn't take up quite as much of the winglet there. So. Yeah, but it's probably not £30,000. It's probably like 50 quid for a set of... All right. It's also got a little bit of droop to it. If we're going by, you know, droopiness equals bad. Um. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, definitely a bad idea. That's a good-looking bike on its own, but uh, with those, you're not fooling anyone, <laughs> and you're kidding yourself. Next up, this was an interesting one, mate. Mm. Troy Bayliss's X MotoGP bike has just come up for sale. I think it's actually been sold, but it's from the 2003 Grand Prix season. So it's a Desmo Sedici GP3, ridden by both Bayliss and Loris Caparossi. This is on MCN's website, by the way, which we'll stick a link to down in the description below. So yeah, don't click it, mate. Don't click the oh. link because the question for you is... Okay. Oh, you probably bloody looked already. No, I haven't already, seen it already. Are you going to ask what price is? <laughs> uh, they say the four-stroke liquid-cooled V4 engine and gearbox have undergone a significant overhaul and the bike is now ready to parade. <laughs> so not ready to race, as the KTM slogan is, or ready to take for a spin on the road, because obviously it's MotoGP spec, mm. uh, but certainly ready to parade around the track. Mm. And at the time of racing, Ducati claimed around 200 horses at 16,000 RPM. Top speed of 200 mile per hour, but with a dry weight of just 145 kilograms, which MCM point out is just one kilogram more than a Yamaha R125. Anyway, wowee, what a bike to own, mm. but you're going to need some serious money. And I wondered if you could take an absolute pot shot and see what you <laughs> think this bike is worth or sold for. It always makes me uncomfortable when people ask this because I kind of want to go and overshoot it. And then people seem very disappointed when you way overshoot it because they wanted you to be surprised by how expensive it was. So I'm going to go straight in there. What are we talking about? Like sports cars mm, would be sort of hundreds well, think of like, thousands. Something like a, what is it? The, um, let's say a Ducati V4 Superleggera, the yeah. new one. Mm -hmm. I think that was 100,000 euros, wasn't it? Mm. Um, for like the most limited edition performance-based so factory be bike you could that. get from that. Right, I'm going to go in with 500,000 pounds. Oh. That's not too bad. Yeah. It was 350. Oh, okay. Bargain. Maybe sounds like a little bit less, but to be yeah. fair, you are pulling a figure out of the sky there um, because there's no, like, no indication of what a MotoGP bike is worth. I guess they didn't come up for sale very often. But still, crazy amount of money, and I hope whoever buys it is very happy with their purchase. But then it got me thinking, mm. do you remember a few episodes ago we talked about the 48-cylinder Kawasaki? <laughs> yes. Where are we going with this? A great bike to parade, as Ducati would say. Also, yeah, yeah. a great bike mm. to parade if you can reach the bars over the 48-cylinder engine. Anyway, this one also sold. It, we, we, when we covered it, it was up for sale at Bonhams, and they were sort of pre-promoting the auction. Mm. It's sold now, and so again, don't click on it, don't read it. Given the context of uh, a three hundred and fifty thousand pound <laughs> MotoGP bike, mm. what do you think this one is going to sold for? It's got to be less. So I'm going to say seventy thousand pounds. Not bad. You're doing all right today. Okay. Ninety-two grand. Oh, okay. Pounds. Yes. Okay. 
or $113,427.26, according to RiderPart.com. Nice. That's a bargain. But that means you could buy three and a half? You could. And what? Almost quick, four? Quick maths, how many cylinders is that? <laughs> how many cylinders are you Wait, buying? Yeah, 100 and... Anyway, I'm not going to do it, but it's... <laughs> Over 150 cylinders, let's yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I think, good value. If you price per cylinder, that is a fair point. Yeah. Um, but also crazy that something like that, where someone's whole years of their life have gone into it. Yeah. But I suppose you could argue years of Ducati's resources and team and research and all that has gone into a MotoGP bike. Um, but still, that would be my dream garage, two bike garage, the 48-cylinder <laughs> Kawasaki at £92,000. And a MotoGP bike that I can only parade yeah. at three hundred and fifty thousand yeah. pounds. Next up, mate, we've got comment of the week. Last week we talked about the um, hand-built show, was it mm. out in the US? Mm-hmm. And we picked out some of our favourite custom bikes just to wet our whistle ahead of the bike shed coming up soon. And it was amazing to have a builder or owner of the bike rather comment on that particular episode. Because it was one of the bikes that you picked out as one of your favourites from the whole bunch of like 100 bikes that were in that gallery. Mm. He's called Hayden Reese, And he says, good choice, Rarified Road. That's Tim. Uh, That's actually my 996. Since there's no information on the build page, I figured I could shed shed a little light on it. I found the bike after it had been sitting in a shed for about 10 years. It had a rather unique spec with red wheels and vividly blue fairings. But because of all that, I was able to get it for, get this mate, $2,000, which is equivalent to £1,600 for a Ducati 996. I mean, even if it is in a GOP in spec, uh, that still sounds like a bargain, although I guess it could be a money pit that costs you far, 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 far more than that. Mm. But anyway, since it was already in such rough shape, I didn't feel like it was destroying a beautiful original example, so I figured I could make it my own. That is cool, like, to have that rationale of taking a a bike that otherwise would have probably just rotted or got scrapped or something. You can't really tell from the gallery photos, but it has race plastics with the number one livery of the old race bike, Mm. and that's all done in gold leaf, so it's got a one on the front, I guess. And the paint is is also not super flattered by the lighting, but it is Porsche Forest Green Metallic to pay homage to the Matrix bike. And this is the nice little touch, mate. Mm -hmm. So with the number one livery and the Matrix tribute paint scheme, you get the name The Chosen One, which it has handwritten on the tail section in the old hot rod style. Thanks and love the show. So there's a bit of back story mate it was actually horrible when he bought it went with the matrix vibe which i quite like now because i like the story of giving it the number one and giving it the name the chosen one Mm. it's your intuition to pick out great custom bikes perhaps with a perhaps with a good backstory (laughs) yeah we'll test it i'm I'm not even going to come to the bike shed show because i'm one for one right now and i don't want to ruin that record um so yeah i'll just rather than risk it i think i'll just stay home now i really like the fact that like the little touches with the matrix because i think i mentioned that as well right because obviously i'm a big movie fan so yeah the fact that it was in the color and all the sort of design of it i love the little chosen one uh addition though which obviously we couldn't see from the the build page so yeah that's a nice little detail i love those things because you look around the bike you inspect it and that's kind of what you'd be looking for at the bike shed show is to look around and find these little details where the harder you look, the closer you look, you see more about it. So yeah, lovely. Good bike. But question is, mate, could it be pipped in terms of desirability, in your books anyway, Mm. by this week's Bike of the Week? I saw this one on Bike Exif, and I thought it would be a great candidate for this week because it combines a lot of what we've been talking about Mm. in this episode. So customs, winglets, movies, and also... I wasn't expecting you to bring up suspension on an old BMW R, but it even ties into that. So give this one a little click and have a look, my friend. For this is probably the most spectacular R100 I've seen. I mean, you know, it's not your typical, you know, um, custom cafe racer job. This Mm. is giving it a race bike vibe and it's gone all out. Yeah, yeah. Initial impressions? Uh, Initial impressions are that, well, let's just start with the fact that it's got winglets, um, since that's fairly relevant to today's conversations. Uh, Yeah, okay. Ignoring those. Do you know what they're from? Oh, no. Go on. 
Surprise me. Panigale V4. Okay. Still hate him. Just take him off <laughs> and stick him on. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. No, the rest of the bike, we'll ignore that and park it for a moment. No, the rest of it is very nice. It's an R100, which actually is the same bike that my brother has. Uh, so it's an R100 mm. RT that he had, which was the touring edition with the big fairing, and it was a bit taller. And um, he has tried to sort of drop it down a little bit as well. So that's where the sort of suspension comes into it a little bit. And I, I mean, I know you know the importance of the suspension and how that sort of transforms the ride. But I think if you bought an old bike, you know, you can get the engine to a certain standard. And this is a really strong engine, very uh, torquey, obviously, because of its sort of configuration. Um, I think to, you know, you can get the engine running as you would want it to, but to really transform the ride, it comes down to the suspension and brakes um, and changing the feel of that, really. Uh, and having confidence in a corner for another thing with it. And one of the great things about this, I think, that would work really well is that the engine is uh, carries its weight low as well, so it feels really mm. solid and secure when you're in a corner. If you match that with modern-day suspension, and bear in mind, that suspension is, at, at least it would need a service because, you know, suspension oil doesn't stay <laughs> fresh for 20 years or 30 years. Um, but beyond that, suspension technology has improved massively, so it's a good idea if you can with your custom jobs to do something like this to it. I love the... Uh, Notice anything weird about the suspension? Uh, Specifically at the rear? Let's have a look. Let's scan through. Oh. Without reading. I'm just looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hold on. That's confusing. <laughs> is it like is a cantilever? <laughs> okay. What's going on here? <laughs> okay, let me read it to you, but uh, or give you some of the details cool. rather. But basically what you've got here is um, R9T parts at both ends. So it's got an R90 fork and Brembo brakes, I guess, and it's got its own CNC uh, yokes. But at the rear, they fit in an R90 swing arm, which yeah. you can see it's got that sort of um, paralever design, but it doesn't have a shock because it's actually got leaf springs under the bike. And so okay. that gives it this really clean look. Yeah, it's weird. I don't quite know how it works. I, I It feels like there's something lacking when you actually look, because I was looking at the front originally, when you look at the rear, it's uh, it's weird to see the gap in there because obviously you, your brain just sort of goes, no, there should be something in between the seat and the wheel. Yeah, it's I mean, the, the expense though that must be involved in changing the swing arm from the uh, the R nine T to stick it on there. Yeah, that's not cheap. No, absolutely man. not. That's a hell of an investment. Leaf springs are a real space saver. It's really cleaned things up. In fact, mate, you know my Volvo. <laughs> which we don't have anymore, but we had a yeah. Volvo v- V60. That had leaf springs in the rear because it gave you more boot space. You didn't have the shocks coming up into the sort of where the boot was. Yeah. And it used leaf springs to give you an even wider boot, but it wasn't that comfy on the yeah. rear suspension. I'm confused so, though, because leaf springs is one of those my leaf spring experience. Where they say like it's quite an old technology, isn't it? Leaf springs. It's not like a a new method of doing it. What are the forks from? I think they might be R nine T or I mean they could be anything okay. really, couldn't they? You yeah. could if you've custom CNC'd the yokes, it could be anything. Mm. Um, but uh, it does look a bit like them because of those adjusters on the top. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you can see if you look at the back end of this bike and look underneath, you can see the kind of metal leaf springs. I think that's what it is, going under the back, sort of wrapping around the exhaust system. Anyway, other highlights include carbon bodywork absolutely everywhere. So you've got a cafe fairing. There's a carbon um, sort of wrap around the original tank, I think. Like, not um, a wrap, like vinyl wrap. I think it's like a carbon case. Carbon cylinder head covers. There's some on the front mug guard, on the swing arm covers, the tail section as well. So it really does have a bit of a bling look to it. And the name they've given it is Goldeneye because of the gold pinstriping, stitching, fork, the gold spoke rims. And so that is the little movie tie-in. And because they've given it a bit of that John Player finish as well, which you do see on some custom bikes, it's kind of an old racing paint job. Um, Yeah, I guess that gives it a bit of that classic Bond kind of aesthetic. And so, yeah. The ultimate question that I said I was going to ask you, mate, is does this pip the chosen one? Oh, the chosen one? No. For me, mm. I, no, I prefer, I prefer the, uh, the chosen one, the 996, over this one. 
it's pretty high. This features very, very highly. But yeah, that one is uh, a lot of my favourite things in like one place, which is why I like it so much. Still, you know, fair enough. We've all got our favourites, mate. But has to be said, technically, visually, there's a lot to admire here. It's a really, really impressive build. And so shout out to Jeremy Duchamp, who's apparently the name of the builder. Didn't we say last time as well, France just seems yeah. to knock out some of the most crazy custom bikes. Yeah, when I heard you ramping up to a, uh, a French pronunciation of a name, yeah, I was like, again, really? Can anyone yes, else man. get a look in at making custom bikes? They really have. It's, it's really impressive. Yeah. Prolific. Anyway, that I think wraps things up for today. So a huge thanks to everybody for listening. Like I say, leave your entry for the Bike Shed tickets down in the comments below if you think you can make it. Also, just leave us some comments of what you think of this week's stories. We do enjoy reading them. And of course, we're going to pull some out for next week's comment of the week. So once again, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time.